Hello, everyone. My name is Gerard Robinson. I am the Vice President of Education here at the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm also a fellow of practice at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia. Those of you who follow us know that beginning in September of 2020, uh, every month I've hosted a conversation for our Center for Leadership, Education and Culture, where we talk to professors, educators, advocates, uh, thought leaders, social entrepreneurs and others about a topic of the month. And sometimes in one month we can have one topic with two different groups. Where we're now in June, and I can't think of any better topic uh, amongst many to talk about than charter schools. As many of you know, charter schools is one of the most important educational movements in the last little more than quarter of a century. Um, and we've seen a lot of growth. And as we talk about charter schools today, the reality is a lot that we think we know may be true, but a lot may not be. And so what I want to do was to gather people who know charter schools from the ground up, who've seen this uh, at the beginning uh, 30 years ago, but who've walked different lanes in the charter school space, whether it's a charter school founder, whether it's a lawmaker who made it possible, whether it's a nonprofit leader or others. And so I wanna welcome all of you to today's conversation. And so, as you know, we're gonna do a opening Q&A. Uh, we'll ask each person a general question and then a group question. Once we finish with the group uh, uh, Q&A, uh, you can in the uh, electronic piece, raise your electronic hand. We're gonna do that probably at 4.15 and I'll get a chance to ask as many questions as possible. Some of you have actually emailed me questions in advance because you're at a graduation today and can't make it. And so we'll do the best that we can to address everyone. So. With that, let me begin by introducing our panelists. First of all, let me thank Yvonne Chan. Uh, she's the founder of the Vaughn Next Century Center uh, in Learning Center in California. I grew up in Los Angeles area, so know a lot about her work. We have Dr. Howard Fuller, who is the founder and board emeritus of the Institute for the Transformation of Learning at Marquette University, amongst other things. And he'll tell you that, had a chance to work with Dr. Fuller uh, in a number of capacities. We have Jim Gunner, uh, who's the president and CEO of the National Charter School Institute. Uh, Jim and I, in fact, have had a chance to work at a policy uh, thinking level on charter schools. So glad uh, to have him here. Uh, and last but surely not least, we have Ember Reichgott Young, who is a former Minnesota state senator and the person responsible for authoring the first charter school law in the nation. Uh, Ember's attended. A uh, couple of events that I've had. I've been a big supporter of her work, purchased uh, her book, and I say that as a plug. She's got definitely one of the best books that I've read on the subject. And so with that, let me welcome all of you to uh, this uh, conversation about charter schools at 30. Thank you. So some people know some of you or maybe all of you because of the work that you've done. Uh, and before we talk about charter schools, I always like to open up the individual question, you know, who is Yvonne, who is Howard, who is Jim, who is Ember? Because it will give people a chance to learn about your personal journey leading up to, let's say 1990 or the early 90s when you became involved in charters. So before we go to the 1990s, just give us an idea of your personal journey in the education world that led you to that point. So we've got uh, Yvonne who's all the way on California. And so I'm gonna give her the the first uh, opening for us and tell us about who's Yvonne. Well, thank you. It's so good to be here and very humble to be here too. Um, boy, it seemed just like yesterday that I got on the slow boat from China, arriving in San Francisco, looking for what we call the gold mountain. You know, America in Chinese is gold mountain, but arriving San Francisco after 19 days journey at sea, the American nun, the sisters told me, say, Yvonne, you know, in America, you just turned 18 at sea. You are emancipated. Well, that was a new word. Well, what the heck it means? Well, you have choice. You don't have to come with us to Great Fall, Montana, which I know is very cold. You can set your own destiny. So, yeah, my choice is to set my own destiny. So through a few years working on Mao, I would say they're the working poor, such as 
picking fruits in Central Valley, working dishwashing, uh, taking midnight uh, bus to Vegas and, and serve, you know, all the gamblers, etc. I realized that a good education will really can break the cycle of poverty and that the future belongs to the educated. And bless her heart, my colleagues, that were all struggling. They gave me more of their tips. So I kind of pocket most of the tips so I could go to a community college, which is East LA. And from then on, basically, classroom, here I come. And I started 1968 teaching students with disabilities and has been pretty much a practitioner since. When you mentioned in the student with disabilities in 1968, you were definitely ahead of the game because we wouldn't see into the 1970s. Congress making a big push to work with more students with disabilities. And I'm a graduate of El Camino Community College, so always uh, good to see someone from our, our system. Thank you for opening your story and thank you also for sharing your personal journey, literally, um, uh, overseas to come to the West Coast. And I thought you were gonna tell us that when you went to Vegas, you won a lot of money and was able to fund your school, but we'll, we'll save that for uh, another point. <laughs> so who's Jim? Well, I'm a husband, I'm a father, a friend and a neighbor. I got into education because I couldn't make my mind up between business education and politics and charter schools had them all. When I started, I got involved with Central Michigan University at a young age. Now I have seven kids and two grandkids. The oldest is 26. But this has been a journey of passion. I love trying to inspire hearts and minds and helping people discover the greatness that's within them. And I love the great philosopher Rocky Balboa. Because the one thing that Rocky always said is it's not how hard you can hit, but how hard you can get hit and get up and keep moving. And I think that's been the story of what we're trying to do with education and change. And so I like to think of myself as a change agent and a catalyst for excellence. I know you more from our time in Michigan. Did you grow up in Michigan as well? I did grow up in Michigan. I was the youngest of six kids. My parents were both educators. My mom was a middle school math teacher. My father was a principal superintendent and then later a college professor of school law and school finance. And so I grew up at a dinner table where there was a lot of talk about education, and I knew that I wasn't going into education, but my heart and my head brought me back to it because I really saw it as one of the best ways to make an impact and to really change the world. And so I got into this with a bit of that uh, nostalgia and naivety of youth, and I've learned a lot of things the hard way. But my passion for education, and as Yvonne said, how it can transform lives is burning hotter than ever. Okay, so another thing. And since you quoted one uh, philosopher boxer, I'm going to also quote uh, philosopher Mike Tyson, uh, who said, everybody has a plan until you get hit in the mouth. And so we That's know about that work in the charter movement. Let's go to some of the mother of, the, of this work. Who is Ember? First of all, uh, Gerard, thank you so much for this uh, panel. Um, it just takes me back so many years to see all these good friends. Uh, and we've all been working together and still are working on chartering even after 30 years. So thank you for that. Who I am, well, um, I came from a family where neither of my parents even finished high school. Mm. And um, they, um, they were so intent upon me having a good education that it became a priority for our family. And they did everything they could to make sure that I had a good education in our public schools and then on to become a lawyer. And um, along that way, um, I was an intern in Washington DC for our Senator, uh, Walter Mondale. Mm -hmm. And I was thrilled to learn that he had a task force on uh, women and and children and families. And it was the first time I'd ever heard anything about such things like family violence, um, domestic violence, that sort of thing, and really started to understand the policy implications behind that. 
And that's what motivated me to run for the Minnesota State Senate at a very young age, at the age of 28, elected at 29. Um, and I was there because I wanted to prevent family violence. And I also was very interested in education. So I was able to get myself uh, appointed to the education committee. And I served on that for my entire 18 years in the Senate. Um, the thing about that is that, again, I've never had children, but the thing that in interested me so much about education was the way we could impact the community and how we could make innovative choices to help our kids. And we'll talk about that a little later, but uh, that's where I come from, the Senate and the policy side of things. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a parent. Did you grow up in Minnesota? Grew up primarily in Minnesota, having been born in Detroit, Michigan, that's Jim Gunner's territory, and lived in Chicago on the south side for a few years, and then came to Minnesota. Thank you. So last person, who's Howard? I'm actually still trying to figure that out, Gerard. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I was actually uh, born in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, came up in Milwaukee when I was six years old. Um, and so I went to high school uh, in Milwaukee, uh, graduated from North Division High School. Um, because I played basketball, that was my way uh, to college. So I went to what was then Carroll College, is now Carroll University. And I'm the first black male to graduate uh, from Carroll. Uh, my first two years, I was the only black person <laughs> uh, in the school. Um, and when I got out of, um, uh, when I got my bachelor's degree, I was trying to decide between becoming a teacher and a social worker. Uh, so I majored in sociology, minored in secondary education. I ended up getting my master's degree in social work. It was about the time that, and so when I got my master's degree, uh, I'd, I'd gotten the first Whitney Young scholarship. And so I owed the Urban League a year. So I worked for a year in the Chicago Urban League. It was about that time that the uh, Great Society program came into being. And so I went down to North Carolina where I was hired, uh, you know, to essentially uh, run a, a, a part of a community action program. And that's where I learned to become a community organizer. And from that work, I ended up leading the effort to create Malcolm X Liberation University which got me into Pan-Africanism, which got me into Africa, which got me into Mozambique, where I spent 30 days with a guerrilla column in Mozambique. Uh, and so when I came back, um, you know, I did some more, I guess people call radical organizing, decided to come back to Milwaukee. Uh, ultimately ended up working for the EOP program, which is a trio program, um, Upward Bound Special Services and Talent Search. And that got me involved in the local education fights like around my high school. And so I had the good fortune of working with Polly Williams to create the first voucher program uh, in the country. And that's when I heard about these crazy people in Minnesota who were talking about this thing called charter schools. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, I tell you, you know, there's an argument between, I don't know if it's Ted Caldery, Joe Nathan, and Ember, like where was the first national conference? I say it was in, in, in uh, Roy Romer's mansion in Colorado. There was 30 of us, but I don't know. And somehow I got connected to Jeremy behind all these people. But, um, you know, uh, so like the rest of the people on this panel, um, I've been working to try to make sure that low-income uh, children with a focus on black children have a chance for quality education. And I just view that it's never in their best interest to only have one option in this country. And so for me, charter schools, other forms of parent choice provide an opportunity, particularly for low income parents who don't have the kind of choices that those of us with money have. It gives the ability to make some choices around their children. So that's pretty much me. Great. Hey, Jared, if I could just slide in there, that comment Howard just made is one of the things that I look back 25 years. One thing that's very memorable is Howard said, the great thing about choice is whether you use it or not, you have it. Mm. Right. 
And we've been joined by Linda Brown, uh, who is the founder of Building Excellent Schools. I've known Linda for a number of years. Linda, welcome. And we're actually at the part of the session you joined at the right time where you can give everybody an opportunity to tell us who is Linda? How did you get involved in education up to the time of the charter school movement? Where'd you grow up? Those kind of things. Oh, we can't hear you, Linda. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and then we'll, we'll go from there. Well, while she's doing that, um, there she I is. I did it. Yes, you got it. I got it. You hear yeah, me? I can hear you. Yes. We can always hear you, Linda. Wow. I don't know what to think about that. That's a good comment. <laughs> That's a good one. I, I'm glad to be uh, on this panel with a lot of old people. Uh, old in my... Not old, not <laughs> old, not old. Not old. Not pick. Uh, and then excuse me, Yvonne. I know how old you are. <laughs> I checked every one of you for how old you are. It won't surprise you that Jim's the youngest. Hey, but we all look good. Look at that. Wish they look like me, my non-charter colleagues. Tell me, well, how come you look so good? Well, because I have choice. But look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more about the charter college, but I grew up in a small town uh, on the North Shore of Boston, and um, I really didn't like it. I mean, I, I, I don't know why I didn't like it, but I never went back. I never went to a reunion. I never, I've never told anyone this. I never went to a reunion. I didn't want to go back and see teachers. I just wanted to leave. And so when I was, I left and I went to the wrong college because I only wanted to go to like premier colleges and that was interesting because I didn't get into any of the premier colleges. Mm -hmm. And I decided I would choose a college that had two names because colleges that rejected me had two names. Like, uh, oh, I won't go into that, but I got into a college in uh, near Albany. I went and I hadn't checked. It was a college for uh, actually for gym teachers for, um, women it was all girls it was for women who wanted to be physical education teachers and there i am i never wanted to be a physical education teacher and i, I was pretty unhappy i just i split close to the end of that first year and i didn't go back there i just didn't want to be with those people I'm going to choose the word people rather than a negative term, people. And um, I went, then went to Boston University, which was so huge. I mean, I could get lost every single day. And I think there was something charming to me about that. And met a nice group of, uh, why is Howard's picture up that Howard's gone? Oh, because if, if you say mute, then just your image goes up? You had to step away for a second and he'll be back. Okay. So. Actually, uh, I'm, I'm here. I just, I just got off. I'm here. Okay. I mean, that there was something I said, Howard. So it, I, I think I did very well by choosing to study philosophy because I knew I could do so much with that. And we all know there's not a lot you can do with philosophy. Gerard's done the best of all of us with philosophy, but um, you know, after that, I, um, I applied for jobs in uh, uh, publishing. A lot of young women did go into publishing and editorial assistance, and so did I. And I worked for an educational publisher, and I think that's where the bug hit me. I decided that was a realm that I felt very comfortable in. Um, got married, had a kid while I was working, but I had a live subject 
in my own kid to watch how this the development and the evolvement of interesting thinking happens. And I w watched and listened and interacted and I found that there was something so fascinating to me about being able to teach. I think that's the first time I thought about, I'm teaching someone to do something they've never done before. Mm -hmm. Never, whether it's uh, talking, whether it's forming sentences, whether it's, it doesn't matter what it is. So anyway, my son was my first experiment. And then I went on to be the director of his preschool. And then, I mean, it went in steps to there so that by the time my son was five, I was the co-director of a independent school K to eight with 350 students. And I loved it. I loved every part of that. Mostly I loved watching what happened when children got good stuff. And, uh, and I don't know at what break it was. It was after 20 years or, yeah, 20 years at this wonderful independent school that I said, the hell with this. Why can't I do this for the poor kids in Boston? I'm doing it in Cambridge for kids who aren't poor. And um, I think that's the real beginning of the passion that, I wasn't gonna use the word passion, of the excitement that this all has brought to me and really given me life. Thank you. And thank you for the shout out for philosophy because when I told my parents, both working class parents from the South that I was gonna major in philosophy, they all but laughed and cried at the same time. But thank you for the shout out for doing okay in life. <laughs> We'll come back to you, Linda, because we have some questions about uh, your work with Building Excellent Schools. So, Amber, let me go to you. Um, Minneapolis, in many ways, uh, has been a, an epicenter for reform and education for decades. Uh, you had experiments with uh, dealing with desegregation. You had experiments with different type of models for public schools. And you decided as a lawmaker and someone in the city, I want to create something called a charter school. And so I'd like to know a couple of things. Number one, uh, what was the impetus to make you move forward with the idea? Why was the time right, uh, right in the early uh, 19, I guess 1990, late 80s versus earlier? And who was on board, who wasn't, and how'd you get it passed? Well, I think what started it was there was this report called A Nation at Risk that said mm -hmm. that our public education system wasn't doing its job. Well, we had a governor by the name of Rudy Perpich, Governor Rudy Perpich, a Democrat, who wanted to make some changes. And he proposed in the 80s something called open enrollment, where you could have a public school student go to any district in the state of Minnesota. They could go into someone else's neighborhood. Um, and that proved to be a difficult sell, but we were able to pass that in about uh, three years. And I happened to be the author of that. Well, once we had open enrollment, there was a constituency built and we had more choices. And once we had more choices to access, the question became, what if all the choices were the same? And that really was an issue. And what if the choices weren't in the neighborhood where the students were? Because not everybody could afford to get on a bus and go across town to find their particular school through open enrollment. And so chartering became that next step, if you will. The interesting thing is that that idea came to me at an Itasca seminar, that's the head of Mississippi, um, in 1988 when Al Shanker, the president of the American Federation of Teachers spoke to a group about education reform because we had just passed open enrollment. And he was the one who said in that seminar, you know what, the districts can take their students for granted. Yeah, they could. You move into a neighborhood and you go to that school. There's no other option. And he wanted to create something called charter schools. In his view, charter schools were an opportunity to empower teachers, 
to make them the professionals that they were, to allow them to be the decision makers they could be and to flex their wings and try new and different things in the classroom because sometimes their hands were tied as part of the system. Well, that is why I, as a Democrat, a union endorsed Democrat, decided chartering might be just the way to empower teachers. Because I had had a friend in college who had left teaching because she couldn't do what she wanted to do to teach her kids. She didn't have that autonomy. She couldn't take that leadership. So Governor Purpich opened the door with open enrollment and then there was the uh, Al Shanker moment. And then finally, there was a group called the Citizens League, which was a really great community leader group of union people, business educators. And of course, the Citizens League then being very much a part of Ted Coldery's world, um, Kurt Johnson, other pioneers. They put together the proposal of charter schools and that's what I took to the legislature. So I give them the credit for the very important work that went into creating that law, which continues to be a big part of the model law today. And I give credit to an unknown Senate council who wrote that law. So there were a lot of people, a lot of people behind the scenes. It took three years to pass and um, passed by only three votes. And we can go into that mm -hmm. later, but that's how I got into chartering. Thanks for that history um, and bringing into context some of those points. You're being the first state. So let me kick it over to Yvonne because she's in California and they were the second. I think we're frozen here. Maybe I should continue on and filibuster. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Are we good? Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you. Yeah. So Ember provided very good foundation. Minnesota's the first state. California becomes the second state. Yvonne's uh, in that state and decides to open a school. Similar question for you. Um, what was the aha moment for you when you said, you know what, I'm gonna create a school. And you didn't create a school in Beverly Hills. You created a school in a neighborhood where you said people need this school. Walk us through your aha moment and what did it take to bring people around an idea that was relatively new in California to move forward to create the Vaughn Next Century Learning Center? Wow, okay. In my situation, is mine is a conversion school. Mm -hmm. I was the principal of this failing school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can compare before and after. So having working for Los Angeles Unified, you know, for 22 years as classroom teachers, two coordinator, two administrator, two central office in charge of special ed and Title I. I kind of had it made. I mean, you know, I was groomed for, you know, what, you know, a uh, high office. And that was, whoo, gee, American dream, right? Going to be a superintendent, whatever it is in a big district. However, I cannot handle those paperwork, all those bureaucracy, especially in a poor neighborhood. I saw the money got wasted. But still, I say, I went back to school, put me back in the school as a principal. Turn around two already. But then here comes Vaughn Street School, neighborhood school, built in 1950, 100% segregated. But unfortunately, you know, there was racial strife. We're located just a few blocks from the Rodney King incident, okay? And of course, you have NWCP, MALDEF, everybody tried to mediate. And after principal, after principal, death threats for principals, they have to assign an Asian. Well, Spanish speaking kind of experience. Hmm. So I was mandatory assigned to this school as this failing school in the Title I terrible, you know, list that has to be improved. So I was assigned in 1990 to sweep stuff under the blanket or under the carpet. So, but I was very clear. I said, hey, I hope I'm not assigned because I'm an Asian and Spanish speaking and that I am competent and I will be able to do what it takes. And I do, I have blessed their heart, Los Angeles Unified, although I fought them later on, is they supported me those first three years. So my aha moment is, here comes Amber and the Minnesota one. Wow, how wonderful that is. But it won't quite fit, you know, because I have a thousand kids. My job, 
is to manage 26 buses on racial integration and not about academics, okay? So, well, what is it? Well, Yvonne, basically, is handcuffs off. Wow, how wonderful. All the things I don't want to do, I don't have to do. But accountability is on. Ooh. And 10 years gone, I belong to union. All our ministry belong to union. Your 10 year bye bye. But you get to own it. Why won't you give yourself tenure? Yeah, I can give myself tenure. So those aha moment is basically now I am licensed to dream. That mm -hmm. American dream before is very fake, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now it is a true one. So mobilizing is the fact that we have the facility. I have the staff. Yeah, some are burned out. Some are going to retool. Some left. But academically, we're solid. Although it's 100% Title I, although it's like 78% English learner, total 100% segregated. Academically, I was able to rally the troop. Just say celebration time. Here we go. Four years from the failing school, we won the California Distinguished School. A year later, went on to win the National Blue Ribbon School. I took 182 people to Washington DC to accept the award. Not me alone, 180 parents and kids. And bless Howard University put us up, Howard Borman, I mean, everybody, we're all over town to accept that. So that's the spirit. Another big win is, darn it, I stopped the busing. No more buses. I don't want to see a single one taking the gifted kids out. I don't want to see them taking all my special ed kids out. 260 black and brown kids out and four white kids in. Stop it. Come home. All the kids come home and took over also the equal funding formula. So that's a big win. Another big win at that time is definitely, I will say PR, PR for charter schools because bang, $1 million surplus year one. I didn't know that we have so much money because of poor school, because it never came to Vaughn. It came some, went somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So Diane Sawyer came and did the whole prime time live. Mm -hmm. When we managed to bring the school clinics, social work, Alamon and all that stuff, Hillary Clinton came. Now don't tell me, that is big, big time PR. So highly, highly visible took all the crack houses. You sell cocaine, one's gonna bite you out. I got money now, bought you out. What do you mean Charter cannot own property? Fought two to the nail, all the way to wherever as the first Charter in a low income, but have a lot of, I say, oof, and my people have experience to take that on. We have all the legislators on our side. What I don't have, I will say, the hard thing at that time for us is everybody say, well, yeah, they're Vaughn. Vaughn can do it. If Vaughn can do it, they will set the precedence. So we have a lot of that kind of pushback and we're still not unionized. I had seven union when I was the principal. After five years, not that we decertified them, it's just uh, the people don't want to pay. So, I mean, they try many times. And now 30 years later, we're still not unionized. So, you know, I, I do have struggles right mm -hmm. now, you know, going through whether it's staffing, whether it's policy. So many of us, and you know, California, is, we have a lot of charter schools and we have some of us who just prove to the point that we can't be policy makers. So a few of us get to serve on the state board now I'm going into the county board and so forth to make sure that we have good charter and deny bad ones. So that has been the 30 years. That's a great story. Very similar to Ember, you as an educator said, let me do this. Empowering teachers, in your case, a principal to do this. Um, I grew up as an elementary school in the 1970s in Los Angeles. And I actually remember some of my friends who, were, who would have gone to Crenshaw High School or Westchester were bused to the Valley 
Kennedy mm -hmm. High School and all these other places. So you're bringing back some memories. So we've got California, we've got Minnesota. Let's go to Michigan. And so Jim, let's go to you. You're also in a state that was an early adopter of a charter law. You've had a chance to work in different executive positions supporting nonprofits that in fact supported charter schools. What attracted you as a nonprofit leader to the charter sector and how have you utilized your current position and previous positions to work with policymakers, advocates, and even the business community? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a great adventure. I call it the journey, right? And so I'm a big fan of Jim Collins' work and his book, Good to Great. And he talks about this journey towards greatness. And the thing that resonated with me, Gerard, was that greatness had three elements. It was organizations that delivered superior performance, they had a distinctive impact, and they had lasting endurance. And so when you hear Yvonne talk about 30 years, that's an, a great example of excellence, right? That lasting endurance and impact. My personal story, Governor John Engler um, signed Minnesota, or Michigan's charter school law into place in 1993. Those first schools went to open in 94 and they got shut down just before they were supposed to get funding because our teachers union, the Michigan Education Association brought a suit and said they weren't real public schools. They didn't deserve to get funding. And so I entered the picture in 1995. And what had happened is that they came back and passed a second charter law. They tried to address the rulings in the court and started over. And so I joined a guy named Dr. Robert Mills at Central Michigan University. And he said to me, Jim, um, I've been, you know, doing education for a long time, but I'm taking over this new thing and I'm going to need an associate. Would you be interested? He said, come with me to a meeting. And that was a meeting where the Central Michigan University Board of Trustees authorized about 30 schools in April of 1995. I started immediately after, and I worked with all the founders and all the attorneys and with the universities to put the first charter contracts in place and get the schools open. It was a formative learning experience because I got to see the law and the contract and all the details, but I also got to see the passion and the commitment. Founders that were second mortgaging houses for startup money. And so I say charters have come so far. And my father was a bit of a philosopher. He'd say corny things like, hey, if we waited for the freeway, we'd have never gotten to California. And so those early days, that notion of charters as a pioneer is like, it, you know, you're going through the jungle and machete, and then there was a path, and then there was a trail, and then they poured gravel. And now we've got schools that can get a million dollars of startup money through the federal charter school grant program to open or to expand or to replicate, unheard of. So after being at the university for a couple of years, I went and started the State Charter School Association. We know that as the Michigan Association of Public School Academies and Dan Quisenberry followed me and has just done a great job in taking that organization to great heights. But the reason I left is because we were getting our teeth kicked in. And we knew that we could charter great schools for kids and families, but if we couldn't persevere in government relations and public relations, that it was for not. And so that took me to that journey. And I was in the halls of the state capitol and, you know, duking it out and trying to defend charter schools, spending a lot of time with the media. And from there, I got tapped to go back to the university, They'd gone through a tough performance audit. I thought I'd go back for a year or two, clean things up, and I ended up staying 12 years. But I learned something huge in that, and that is infrastructure and the importance of it. So not only were we an authorizer at the university, but we saw ourselves as an agent to help build the state national movement. And so I was privileged to be part of founding NAXA, helping with the National Alliance and other organizations. And I'll never forget going to my first Bayo conference and meeting Dr. Howard Fuller and being the only white guy in a sea of uh, African-Americans. And it was just a phenomenal experience. I call it getting out of the neighborhood, right? I was out of my neighborhood. I was the, you know, the, the, the I guess the Midwesterner learning how things worked. And I just have learned and grown so much in this. But the thing that I really learned as an authorizer is that the standards and the accountability were not gonna get us to the promised land that it was really gonna be about people taking ownership and taking responsibility. Because the thing about winners is you don't have to hold them accountable because they're doing great things because it's in their DNA. And I just look at your panelists. The reason they've had such an impact 
is because they brought their who to their what. They brought the who, who they are, what drives them to building excellence and sharing it with others and helping others discover the greatness within them. That brought me to the National Charter School Institute. We're a nonprofit, 501c3. We work across the country. But where there's great organizations advocating for policy changes, we actually help those people implement them. So we work with schools, management companies, school boards, authorizers to what we try and call optimize that three-legged stool so kids, families, communities can win. Thank you. And what's interesting that you mentioned is the fact that you were sued or your law was sued. And in fact, Michigan, California, part of a number of states where people sued because people questioned the publicness of charter schools. And the fact that we still call them public charter schools, we don't say public magnet schools. So 30 years later, we're still in the battle. But the great thing is when it's gone to the state uh, Supreme Court in the states, states have actually come back, the courts have come back and said, no, these are public schools, part of an experiment to do something unique. So we've heard from Minnesota, California, Michigan. Let's go to Massachusetts, an early uh, adopter as well of a charter law, uh, Tom Birmingham, a uh, working class uh, kid from Boston uh, who was a mechanic or part of a mechanics union, went to Harvard, became a Rhodes Scholar, came back into the legislature and said, guess what? I want to do something different. I want to push for charter schools. And Linda Brown says, yeah, that's great. One thing to talk about policy, one thing to talk about school founding, but boards matter. So Linda, tell us why you decided to create Building Excellent Schools. Why do we need good boards to find and work with good leaders? And what was your aha moment to go that route? The first part of the question is really um, sharp, uh, sharp of you to ask. Uh, there were, as, along with Tom Birmingham, there were, uh, rich people who were discouraged with how there wasn't a lot of academic achievement happening. And charter schools came along, these elderly, <laughs> I can't believe I'm using that word now, these uh, older people um, who'd been around education who were clamoring now for something different they all got together. I was in the room because I was working with Jim Pfizer at the time. He's currently the um, Gerard, what's his title? Education Secretary. Secretary of Education in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Uh, and I think he always wanted to be that. I don't understand why, but is it so? It, it, they, these mostly men sat around and were very disparaging of what we were seeing in the few charter schools that existed. I think they were 10 or 15 at the time, charter schools. We're not a cautious state in general, but in specific when it's easy for the union to get involved, uh, the numbers on the charter schools certainly have been kept down. And uh, what, the, what the assembled group of elders was right about was that there wasn't enough progress. And I said a word that sometimes I wish I hadn't, but I said, there's no urgency around it. Mm -hmm. We were not seeing a lot of urgency. Uh, and I thought that was a word that we ought to put in place. We ought to put it in motion. If we were saying it, then let's do it. And the other thing that we realized at this meeting was of, we took a line of the zero to 10 and ranked the schools we thought were the best of the crop. And none of us could really rank the schools higher than a six. That was one school. And this was on an academic, it was very short data to work from because it was only the first few years of chartering, but and the question is from Gerard, why, why was it necessary to start building excellent schools? It became very necessary when you had to fight hard to win. You won the whole argument about charter schools or not, and yet you weren't producing. You said you were going to produce something. 
and the state was right to call the card in. Come on, we need to do it or not. And that was a push for us. And um, Jim and I sat down later and I said, he said, we have a little money from this foundation. What, what do you want to do? And I said, well, what do you want to do? And I, he said, let's do charter schools. That's, that's great. That's great. Let's do it. And, and with the extra money, let's put together within this entity that we'll call, he, Jim wanted to name it Building Excellent. And I said, well, Building Excellent, what? Tires? Book covers? What, what were we building? Should we say schools? He said, oh, all right. Well, we could call it Building Excellent Schools. And so that was the, the title. And um, the board piece comes, Gerard, at about this time because I don't know how many people say it or have it tacked up on their refrigerator. Um, you know, behind every good school, there's a fabulous board. I mean, we would hope that every school could have a board that started at the same time the school did. And if there was unity and unison and urgency on the part of the board, and that boards knew how to be boards. It's one thing to help them shape themselves into a board and have them understand the truncated Roberts rules and, they, and, and you do everything to look like a board, but unless you understand, as a couple of our fellows have not understood that you can't have three guys named John from the same law firm sitting on the same board, it doesn't work that way. And um, it, it not only doesn't work that way, it's very destructive, but the, the role of a good board still, I think, is underrated. That the, the image of a strong board, we ought to take with us as we visit other schools. We ought to go to board meetings. What do they look like? We need to ask our own boards, what is it that you think we should do more of or less of? And no hands went up. And it was a good meeting of charter school board people. And clearly there was some fear of asking questions. I was not scary, but there was a fear. I said, what's up? What, what, what's not happening? Well, what wasn't happening is that no one was talking to each other. This we can get to later when we get into communities. Mm -hmm. but you need to have your board develop a community, both of themselves and of the people and places surrounding the school. And Yvonne's stories are legend. Uh, what, Yvonne, what you did when you wanted to have help building an addition to the school or schools is that you went to the neighborhood and you does that mean anything that will beep? I thought you beeped me off, Joy. Um, and Yvonne had the local community. She bought them a beer. Every day she'd buy them some beer after they finished work, give them a little money and they'd go and the next day they'd come back and they were the parents of the kids who were at the school. So they really thought it was, uh, it, it, to be there with, for them was that they were doing this for their own families. Mm -hmm. And it is whenever we get to talk about community, I think about Vaughn Next Century Learning Centers as being most representational of that. At any rate, um, so Building Excellent Schools had enough money, we had a third, $300,000 mm -hmm. from some foundation. And that paid the stipends of our first six fellows, which then were all Boston based. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like a way to have a trial run. For me, it was like excitement about being able to boss around a bunch of kids. I loved it. It was just, and the, you know, they were kids sure. because the fellows come in at age 25, 32, 35. 
and they're eager to learn, you have to have the right curriculum. I'm not gonna go into that detail now, but two years after we started the Building Excellence Schools Fellowship, uh, another foundation, Walton actually came and said, you know, we think you could take this national. I said, oh, great idea, we could go national. So for me, national meant New York, Washington, D.C., oh, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was the extent of my thinking that was national. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think we work in 26 different states. Mm -hmm. uh, very national. In the beginning, it was somewhat national. I'd say now it's very national. And boards still are a super important part. We have a whole new, not new, a whole separate division of what we do, which is board related. Thank you. You made a couple of points I want to note. Number one, boards matter in the private sector, and yet in the nonprofit sector, we don't think they matter as much. And your work has shown no, they matter because these are organizations independent of uh, 501 uh, C3 status or not. And number two, there's a gender dynamic that's been in play in 30 years. You know, the number of women in leadership roles and policy, in founding schools, but also in running nonprofits, and often saying that if we don't change how the boards look, they're not going to look different. That's right. It's like Boston, which school board was founded in 1822, oldest in the country. Those were some very bold things to do. So thank you for bringing us there. So we've talked to Minnesota and California and Michigan and Massachusetts. Let's now go to Wisconsin, another early adopter of a charter school law. Dr. Fuller, you were um, the um, Milwaukee Public School Superintendent as well. And so you've seen a system-wide change like a Los Angeles or a Minneapolis or a Boston or even a Detroit desegregation busting part of that conversation as well. You decided you wanted to support charter schools for that city. Uh, what was your moment to say, hey, we've got to do this? And then number two, you've talked about the importance of making sure Black people, teachers, students, and leaders have a role in this. Talk to us about how that looked in Milwaukee and how that mushroom mesh. Thanks for that, Gerard. It was, uh, it's really interesting to sit here and look at that history and listen to that history. I think though, before I answer your question directly, mm -hmm. um, the thing that bothers me is that a significant number of poor children are still not being educated. After all of the work that all of us mm -hmm. have done and, you know, and it's all good <laughs> and everything. But when I, you know, when I look at what happened during COVID, when I look at just how clear it became that in spite of all our efforts, uh, a significant number of our families, particularly those who are poor, black families, brown families, um, you know, so we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. Let me, let me, let me, let me just say that. And 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 but but I do think that charters have been a part of changing the dynamic. Uh, that is to say that were not for charter schools, there's a significant number of things that now happen in this country that would not be happening. And there are a significant number of young people whose lives are much better off because of the work. The reason why I decided to get into the charter uh, space as young people call it today is that uh, when we, uh, because of the courage of Polly Williams, passed the first voucher school bill in Wisconsin, it became clear that there were people out there who had problems with a private school effort, but wanted to see something significantly different happen in the quote public sector. So when I found out about the effort that Ember and Ted and all those people were making in Minnesota, with the passage of the first charter school law in Minnesota, um, I got involved to try to make that happen in Wisconsin. And as you all will remember back then, um, her name was Berline. And she, I think she was at LSU. 
And what she was doing was she was she she had developed a way to look at strong charter school laws and weak charter school laws, mm -hmm. and and the determination was ultimately that the strongest charter school laws were those that were independent of the school board, that that there was some other entity, and like in Michigan, it was universities, for example. So you so the first law that got passed in Wisconsin was a very weak law. And it was so weak that even though I helped pass it and I was the superintendent, I never proposed a charter school in the city of Milwaukee. Number one, because it was only school boards could pass it. Number two, we could only do two. And so there were all of these stipulations that were horrible in my opinion, right? And, 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 and so, you know, even though I helped pass it, I didn't use it and we really didn't uh, become effective until I think it was 1994, 1995, when we passed what was called 2R charters in Milwaukee, which gave uh, the city council, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Area Technical College, along with the school board, the authority to charter, because that gave us our first independent charters. And so what happened then in Milwaukee was that we had the voucher program for low income uh, 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 families and now the charter school effort. And so what I saw was the possibility of a, a different type of education ecosystem. And you know what it is I'm talking about because you came and worked for us for two years and you know all the battles that we fought every year literally since then to protect choice uh, in the state of Wisconsin, including charter schools. So, so for me, Gerard, all of this is about staying committed to purpose and not to the institutional arrangement that gets you to purpose. And what I mean by that is I'm a strong supporter of charters as long as they work for the, for the kids and families that we have. But if they don't work, then we need to do something else. And, and, and so as long as we can keep in mind why we do what we do, that ultimately it is about these children. It is about giving them a chance for a better life. And I will be forever grateful to people like Enver and Ted, but then the people who picked up the mantle like Yvonne and the stuff that uh, Linda's done and Jim and all, all of these people all around the country that we all know who took a lot of flack and are still taking flack for just trying to do better <laughs> for our children, right? Because in the final analysis, and, and I'll end with this, it's still about power. It's, 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 it's still about who controls the flow and distribution of the money. Who, who, who controls the, the, the capacity to determine where resources go. And so with all of the, well, we're against charters because they're not public, blah, blah, blah. That's all a smokescreen. It's, it's all about trying to prevent the people from getting power. <laughs> and it's interesting because many of these people who do that claim to work in the interests of the people. But what we know that ultimately it's the interests of the bureaucracy. And, 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 and I'll, I'll, I will end with this. You know, I told uh, Jonathan Kozel that, right? Mm -hmm. Because Jonathan was out here running his mouth about how horrible charters were. And I told him, you know, Johnson, you should read your old books. You should, you should read your mm -hmm. books before you got bought off, when you were actually talking about power, you know, giving power to the people. And for me, what charter schools are, are one way to give power to the people. And you mentioned Jonathan Kozel, also a Rhodes Scholar. He wrote at least one book I remember long before Savage Inequalities, Death at an Early Age. Yeah, that's the one I told him he should go back and read. Yeah, which I believe was about Boston. It was. And, and yeah. about that school with the broken windows and all of yes. that. What are you talking yes. For those of you who are watching live, those of you who watch later, you have had uh, in about an hour a real history lesson about not only charter schools, but about entrepreneurship, about boards, about policy, about school founding. When you have people who've actually started schools, it's not as easy as you think. And so we're getting the benefit of listening to people who've seen this from the ground level. So those were individual questions. Let me give you a, a broad question. You can weigh in on uh, any point that you want to. So 30 years in, uh, we have over 3 million children who are in charter schools, uh, numbers you know, ticking up. 
40 plus states who have charter laws, uh, even though approximately 90% of charter schools are still authorized by a school board. As some of you have said, universities, you have in some places a, a municipal uh, entity can do so. We have over 270,000 teachers who are in school. In some cities, charter schools make up 25 or more percent of the population. So there's a lot of growth. But at the same time, 30 years later, some of our friends who supported charter schools 30 years ago are now questioning, should we have them or not? We have a lot of research, whether it's from uh, Dr. Patrick Wolf and his team at the University of Arkansas, whether it's from uh, Dr. Fryer at Harvard, whether it's um, a CP program at Stanford, other places have shown that charter schools make a difference. 30 years into this work, are you shocked to hear some of the things you're hearing? And Wendy, what can you tell the generation now who was you 30 years ago, how to stay motivated, what to think to do in order to make sure that 30 years from now, another Gerard is having a conversation with uh, people who are in your seat. And you can just jump in as you like. Gerard, I'll jump in with somebody you know well, and that's Rick Hess. Yep. And Rick, probably 10, 15 years ago now, wrote a piece that said, what people know about charter schools is wrong, but it's because they've been intentionally misinformed. So imagine that 30 years later, Ember is still having to convince people that charters are really public schools. Hmm. That's not an accident. And that's not the charter school movement's lack of education, outreach, and effort. That's intentional misinformation from people that aren't afraid charter schools are going to succeed. But let me say that differently. They're not afraid charter schools are going to fail. They're, going to, they're afraid charter schools are going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And every time a charter school enrolls a student and that money follows him or her to the school, it's a game changer. And so the impact that's happened by giving people choice and allowing them to exercise it has changed the power dynamics. And it goes right back to Ted Caldery. And I think of Ted as the idea guy. And he said really two things that have resonated to me over the years. Number one is you have to challenge the givens. And number two, you have to change the incentives so that people will make tough decisions because they're in their best interest for change. And I think that's really what the charter school movement's been about is to challenge the givens and to change the incentives. Thank you. I would add to that from the policy perspective. One of the things I talk about is that chartering is not a school. It's not an individual school. The innovation of chartering is the law itself. So those 45 laws that have been passed, some are better than others, but that law opens the door so people, ordinary people, citizens like you and me and parents and teachers can try something different, can try something innovative in education without being bound by the constraints of the educational system. And yet, chartering has within it the accountability measures to make sure that it works. Now, sometimes a school isn't going to succeed, but that doesn't mean that the innovation of chartering doesn't succeed. And what we have to do is learn how to better hold ourselves accountable within that system. And what I've found to be the case is that you can usually trace problems in chartering to two things. One, a school leader who just isn't up to the job or entrepreneurial enough to, uh, to do more than education, but to also manage and to do the other things that an entrepreneur needs to do. And then the other is the board and having good solid board members as Linda was talking about. Now the problem I found in chartering is that many educators who saw, serve on these boards have often never served on a board before. So they don't know what governance really is or is supposed to be. And that's why I think the work that Linda and Jim Gunner does on the boards is one of the most critical things. Another thing that has held back chartering over the years is facilities. And even today, only 12 laws actually state that charter schools can get some facility aid. Another 13 or 14 say they're part of the bigger public school system. 
But that's always been an issue as well because they don't get the same funding as district schools. And finally, I'm just gonna go back to what Jim Gunner said about the, shall we say, intentional misrepresentation of what chartering is. I'm here as a Democrat and I am here to say it has been bipartisan from the get-go. And what I don't care for today is how partisan his has gotten. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that's why I'm here. That's why I'm still here is because we need to go back to working together. We need to go back to finding the commonalities between chartering and district schools so that we can learn from each other. Because guess what, in COVID, we're all trying to deal with learning loss and we can learn from one another. And let's, let's do that together. I was just in Washington DC last week and learned there that you're nearly half and half, 50% chartered schools and 50% district, and they're learning how to play well together. And they learn from each other. And that's what I wanna see in the charter world. So um, we need to dispel the myths and we need to also bring forth the things that we're talking about today. And that's why I am so happy to be part of the National Charter Schools Founders Library, uh, which Jim Gunner uh, initiated at his charter, uh, National Charter Schools Institute, so that we can record and save the pioneering origins of our pioneers while they're here, just like you and, and I, and, and that we can use that history to inform the future. Thank you. Right. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, go ahead, Yvonne. Good evening. Okay. Um, first of all, it's, it's thank you, you know, all the comments. Uh, in a practitioner point of view here, you know, being just at it for 30 years and still there, you know, although I have principals and CEOs, et cetera, I'm still site-based, is that we really continue to struggle with sustainability or leadership on the ground mm -hmm. level. Right, I mean, you know, it, it have, operating a charter school is not for the faint-hearted, okay? I mean, we have policy, finance, and all that, but at the end of the day, that, that practitioner, the operator at the school site got to be able to kind of push the academic, the community, you know, engagement, and definitely the facility and all these efforts, okay, forward. So having said that is that Many of us in California, as you know, we have a thousand charters. We have many anti-charter laws now after 30 years is to make sure that those of us in the field will continue to showcase success. Okay, one is showcase mm -hmm. success mm -hmm. and absolutely not just say in a competitive manner with the school next door store or with the magnet school or whatever school it is, is becoming, and I know you, you didn't hear me say that because Yvonne is always a combative, you know, whatever it is, but I've changed. I couldn't believe that I have changed. I was able to kind of usher myself and my whole community into part of the entire Los Angeles Unified Choice Portfolio, get a voice, pretty well, you know, with key people, board members within Los Angeles Unified. Some of us get ourselves elected into state boards, county boards, whatever boards to be a good policy decision maker. And then of course, as you said, funding facilities, unfortunately for practitioners are crazy. They, they distracted us from there. And I'm so glad that at least in California, and some of us do it ourselves to help each other. You know, I mean, Vaughn, fortunately, is financially extremely strong. So strong that, and I have no problem saying it because this is in the website. I mean, Vaughn right now from a $600 when we converted into the charter, we are sitting with $186 million net assets. Yep. So we should help each other. Right. We'll go to uh, Doug Fuller, then Linda, we'll go to you. Yeah, I, I just want to say, say this. I, I, I live by a mantra, a mantra that says, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. And so the reality of it is that 
some of the stuff that people say about charter schools are true. That is to say that, you know, there have been people who started schools who never should have started schools. There, there have been crooks. There have been people who have ripped off uh, money. That's real. But crooks exist in every institutional arrangement in America. And if you doubt that, look at Congress. Look, look, look at, uh, you, you know, what people are doing now to deny uh, what happened on June 6th, to, to like have us act like this didn't actually happen or that these were all good people. So, so the point I'm trying to make is there are so many wonderful things that have happened because of charter schools. And there have been some terrible things that have happened because of charter schools. And one of the lessons that we've learned in all of this is that a good school is not a good school because it's a charter school or a private school or a traditional public school. It's a good school because it's a good school. And that what we have to be able to do is to identify those places that serve our children well, no matter what kind of school they are, and those places that don't serve our children well. The one thing about a charter school or, or the way that the charter school effort has evolved, um, you, you, can, you can close them. And closing a school is not a good thing, but it's not a bad thing. <laughs> What's worse is leaving a school open that has never served any church. We, we, we got schools out there, and you all know these schools in your communities, that over a 30 or 40 year period, they, never, they, they have failed generations of people, but they're still functioning and they're still getting money from the government. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that we, we, don't, we don't have to tell lies about what charters have done. We don't have to cover up our weaknesses. If we really are for the children, then we have to be honest about where we've served the children well and where we haven't served the children well. But the important thing is, I'll go back to something that Jim said is, the important thing is to have that option. The important thing is to have that ability to serve children differently to have that ability to give parents different ways that they can potentially educate their children. Because every one of us on this Zoom knows that if you have money in America, you got choice. Because if, 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 if schools don't work for your children, you're gonna move, you're gonna put your children in private schools, or you're gonna get the most expensive tutoring on the planet. And so what charter schools are, are a way for families who would not otherwise have a different option to have a different option. And the last thing I'll say on this, Gerard, is, um, you know, I was a part of forming a group called the uh, Freedom Coalition for Charter Schools. Mm -hmm. And we were pushing back at the so-called progressives, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and people like that, who were attacking charter schools and at the same time talking about being progressive. My question always has been, when did it become progressive to attack the self-determination of a people? And so for me, charter schools were about self-determination. It was, it, was, it was about giving families the ability to choose. It was about giving educators the ability to create new schools. It was about giving us the ability to bring together collaborations of people to form different institutional arrangements for our children. And, and I would ask Ember, I know where Ember is on it. At what point did that become a non-progressive idea? I mean, to me, it's the essence of progressiveness <laughs> it, it, to, to give the people the ability to create new institutional arrangements in a democracy. When did that become something that is not progressive? Mm -hmm. Linda? That's, that's a very important piece we just listened to from Howard. That's a very important piece and the two words that are important, or it's one word, the self-determination. Self-determination. Um, I'm gonna remember that. This is uh, what, what words came out to me today. 
uh, self-determination, that's the opposite of tyrannical, but um, I don't have a lot to say now. Um, I agree that, uh, well, I don't know if you'd agree, let me put it that way. I think one of the things we've talked about what charter schools do well, a few things, what I think charter schools and the organizations that surround them don't do very well is communicate. Our communications it, in, inside of our charter school nest and outside our charter school nest are not optimal. Uh, it, it, it isn't that we need to have one brand and we need to have one color. And that's not what I mean. I mean, if we can't communicate well with one another in helping each other know what the next steps are, then the, then the failure will be on us. I, I know one of the next steps is to talk about, or I don't know if that's coming now or later, is to talk about you know what the next 10 years or what's the next decade look like. And I think um, for us, you know, California's been a bellwether in reverse. It's been symbolic of what can happen. Um, it's a very scary a set of scenarios in California at this time. In the last you know, two years have been very telling about how do we communicate and how do the, you were talking about Fs, the F words, not the F word, but F words, facilities and finances and so forth. I have, um, I have another letter that we need to think about and it's a C. And the first part of the C is communications. Mm -hmm. The second part is community because one of the questions Sample questions Gerard threw at us uh, a few weeks ago is uh, in addressing what will happen. What are the next hot issues? I'll just call it hot issues. Mm -hmm. And I think the community work in the community and community itself is part of it. Because if we can't engage communities better than we have, and not just my organization, but all of our organizations. So we're not seen as outsiders all the time. We don't actually need to be insiders, but we need to be inside more. We need to create the community so that there isn't the rant and the cry from folks that, well, they just are carpet baggers. They come in here and they've taken over. They, 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 they you know, they, their work is worth nothing. They don't even know us. They don't know who we are. They're, how do we get into, and it will take activists to help us, how do we all attract community to us, to the schools? So it's like a two-point landing. Um, I have no idea if that's, that's correct, but it's like, uh, hit, the, hit the folks around the school, then hit the schools. And, but it's a positive hit, mm -hmm. not a negative hit. And I, I have to believe that, you know, many of the schools now have hired for positions, activists, positions, they have different names for the position, but those people are responsible for dealing with direct community in the same way 30 years ago, <laughs> Eva Chan was buying her workers beer on a Friday. I mean, she found a way to communicate in ways that then involved them personally in the school. I mean, that was brilliant. You know, why, were, why weren't you more afraid? You should have been afraid of finding approaching people you didn't know. You didn't know who they were. How do you know how they react to you? You put that in your pocket and you said, I need this job done. They live in the neighborhood. They're, and they have children. What could be a better formula? And I... I think about, Yvonne, I think about that community all the time. Um, and, and your brilliance for thinking how to do that. And we have to more, we have to insist from, and from ourselves, more brilliant in being active mm -hmm. community seekers. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm gonna yeah. 
Oh, uh, um, you know, the thing is now with the COVID, you know, big event, and I'm wondering, you know, at what point nationally that we can, I mean, capitalize with this particular big event and, you know, funding resources from the federal government, from state, whatever it is, to kind of propel some of the very much needed initiatives among charters so that it will scale up the rest to the, you know, to kind of seal the community together. Uh, a, a good example is, as you know, that uh, I believe NWACP, they put out something about wanting more community space schools, you know, a, a cluster of schools come together with a school clinic, with social work, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I believe that basically, I could be wrong, that, uh, uh, that many of these, much of the COVID relief funding in most states do distribute to uh, charter schools. And I know that in California, we were the first one to step up to reopen and reopen for students with disabilities. So I'm wondering, here's the post, post you know, about this moving forward five years, 10 years, because I don't think COVID thing is gonna go away anytime soon, is how we can utilize this type of opportunity, I have to say, it's terrible opportunity, but to pivot in terms of the charter school coming the forefront to pull together community resources, to pull together charter schools around the area in okay. order to you know, provide not just the best education, but all the social services and really truly, truly you know, help transform a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take the uh, moderator's uh, privilege and do uh, two things. Number one, I wanna give each one of you uh, an opportunity to uh, just give us some closing thoughts. Uh, we've got people who are charter school founders, people who are thinking about starting schools, people who worked in school and left. We've got philanthropists, we have lawmakers, we've got nonprofit leaders who are trying to think what, as you said, Linda, 10 years from now, what recommendation or advice uh, would you give to people who want to see this conversation 10 years from now look a little different. Linda, since you brought that up, we'll start with you and then I'll pick people up along the way. And as a result of this, we won't be able to go to Q&A, but that's okay. I think we, we save this time for the conversation that we have and there'll be others. So Linda, let's start with you. Just run that main question by me again. In sure. 10 years, in 10 years, what one thing would you say to people so that 10 years from now, this conversation's moved a little further ahead? Well, you know, I think we need to learn from a lot of people. One of them is in our midst, meeting me anymore, but one of them right now, I'm looking at Howard, is in our midst. About, and he can talk to us. This, you know, as he says, no progress without pain. He didn't say that. Someone else said it, but Mm -hmm. He used it, and, uh, and, and it's true that we need to learn how to, how to protest. We have to learn the same way we have to learn how to be a community and form communities. I, I think that we do have to, as well, uh, learn from, again, Howard and other. There are other Howards who are activists who don't happen to be as, I was going to be very silly, but don't happen to be as forceful in my book as Howard. What, what, what can we do to tap that energy? If we say, again, communities, we want this, we want better communication, with, who's going to help us learn how to do it? Sure. I like that. Tap to the energy. Thank you. Jim, what do you think? Uh, perseverance and fortitude are going to be key. You got to have fortitude to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years, hopefully it's easier, but there'll be new challenges. And one of the keys that I think is if you go back to Ted Caldery when he wrote the district's 
the, the exclusive franchise districts have has to be withdrawn. For every state that adopted a charter school law, before that, there was only one provider of public education in a community, and that was the district. It's fundamentally changing because of this idea of chartering. And chartering doesn't make you good or bad. It's an idea. How you implement it, what you do for kids, employees, taxpayers, that determines what good. So I like the notion that great charters are three things. They deliver superior performance, they have a distinctive impact, and they have lasting endurance. I think that's the work for us as we battle on the policy level, that we create environments, we create conditions where greatness can thrive and be welcomed. And I think on the implementation side, it's doing the hard work day in and day out. And I'm going to quote Howard Fuller, the hardest thing besides getting a charter is making it work well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yvonne. Well, our mission is to nurture and grow our alums to be good charter leaders that will continue the hard work and that will continue to sustain all this 30 years effort into at least the next 10 years. Because many in 30 years, we have plenty of alums. And, and I think we really need to see how we can capitalize in that human resources and strength. Thank you. Fuller. You know, the first thing, Gerard, I think we got to quit thinking about 10 years. I think that's too long. I think the way that the, uh, the, the world operates today, we have to have a shorter span. I mean, I get what you're saying. You know, <laughs> we we, we, we want to, you know, we, we want to be here 10 years from now. But I, I, I think because of the speed within which things change, mm -hmm. we got we, we to think incrementally, you know, yeah. even as we project you know, beyond a couple of years. Uh, but I wanted to uh, second something that Yvonne said. Uh, we just had our first two alumni come onto the board of our school. They just yeah. attended their first board meeting. And, and so for me, the, the idea of secession, the, the, yes. the, 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 the idea of, um, you know, planting these seeds that grow. And if you don't do that, and if you don't build that, why do you think we will survive? And so whether it's two years, five years, 10 years, or 20 years, what's absolutely clear is what Yvonne said and maybe Linda said as well, but we got to make sure that the, the young people that, that we are uh, helping to learn, that they come back and help us to learn, right? It is, it is the, 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 the cycle of learning that, that has to take place. Thank you. Ember. Howard, I was going in that same direction. You know, it's been 30 years. That's a whole new generation that has no idea about the history of chartering or the origins of chartering, a whole generation. And I was talking with Milo Cutter, who of course uh, founded the first charter school in St. Paul, Minnesota called City Academy. And she told me that one of her students uh, back in the, you know, the, the 2000s is now the chair of their board of directors and his daughter is going to the city academy so it's a whole new generation and that means we have a lot of educating to do all over again and we need to educate about things like what you were saying community linda community because when we initiated chartering, it wasn't just about the five or 6% of schools that would become chartered schools, but it was about helping lift all boats. And that's exactly what happened in Washington, DC. The district public schools have grown and improved greatly because the charter sector was there. So it was about lifting all boats for the community. And it was about innovation and the opportunity to try new things and make in different ways um, and allowing other people to try that. That is what is going to be the enduring part of chartering. But the new generation doesn't really know that. And until we educate and like these kinds of forums and hopefully bring a whole new generation forward again to help per persevere into the future, uh, we won't succeed. So that's my uh, mission, if you will, this year is to educate as many uh, people in the future generation of charter. Well, Amber, thank you so much for 
your work uh, and being a pioneer in this area as a lawmaker. You know, 45 states had to start somewhere, started in Minnesota uh, because of your work and drawing on your own personal and political history and also talking about the importance of bipartisanship. There was a point where this may have been one of the few issues Democrats and Republicans agreed with. Mm -hmm. President Bill Clinton in office helps create what is now Charter School Week, helped play a role in creating the, uh, uh, the charter school office and the Department of Ed, which helped a number of charter schools open. And presidents moving forward have supported it. But when you talk to people today, they think it's only one party or it's a split in the party, when in fact, this was a bipartisan issue. So thank you uh, for reminding us of that. Jim, thank you so much for reminding us about the practical aspects of chartering about laws, about working with states to make sure that accountability is there. But you talked about contracts. Charter schools are a business, just as public schools are a business. They have contractual obligations to vendors. They have a contractual obligation to its authorizer. In non-charter uh, schools, of course, it's local and state government. But these are the realities, and you've played a strong role in making that happen. And thank you for having an institute where you're going to archive this information, because in the absence of having primary documents, secondary documents. Of course, we're gonna donate this as well uh, to the Institute. It's gonna to be tough two years from now or 20 years from now. So thank you for keeping this alive. Linda, I wanna thank you for reminding us the importance of boards. Uh, boards play a big role in choosing a school leader. If you have a lot of turnover in school leadership, if you've had financial malfeasance, as a charter school uh, authorizer, I had to vote to close a school. And I can tell you that's a tough decision to make when you know that two, three, four hundred right. people are not only going to share children when I have a school, but you've also taken away the financial uh, stability for a family at that school. And so those are some tough conversations, but some of it had to do something with the board, also authorizing, but the board. So thank you for uh, uh, generating, a, you know, creating a generation of people who not only worked on charter boards, but because of their work on charter boards, some of them were invited to then find themselves on nonprofit boards and some of them on for-profit boards. And so someone had to get a start somewhere. And so you made it happen with uh, charter school boards. Yvonne, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles. As I said, I know about your area and your school. You used your personal story and your professional tenacity to open up a school in all odds, making sure it was more diverse than some of the schools that were within a five or six block walk of your school. Talking about the assets that you have 30 years later, there's some schools that are still here 30 years now who don't have the academic support, uh, the academic outcomes you have. Who didn't break the pipeline from going from Los Angeles to places you didn't want to go? You helped and you worked in the area where there's one of the largest cocaine busts in the history of the United States, and yet you opened up a school and you've made sure that people had very different options. And so glad to see you doing that work. And Dr. Fuller, I want to thank you for the work that you did with your school. For those who are looking now, it's the Dr. Howard Fuller uh, Collegiate Academy where every single student who graduated this year was accepted into college. Having worked with Dr. Fuller for two years, lived in Milwaukee as a fellow at the Institute, remembering when that school was CEO uh, at one point and moving up the well, the number of black men and black women in that city who didn't find themselves on a school to prison pipeline, where Milwaukee has one of the highest incarceration rates for black men in particular in the country, you helped to break that through charter schools and sent people to college help people create a middle-class background, but you also use your charter school to hire teachers uh, across the board, give people leadership, and to also make sure that we don't forget that race still matters uh, in America, and to make sure that we talk about it in a way that's safe and sane and will need be to push it forward. And as you talk about power, you said many years ago at an event we both attended, that you believe what Ron Edmonds had to say, that we know what we have and what we need to do to educate children. We know that, that this isn't a knowledge problem, this is a political power. It's a political willpower. And all of you have taken the politically, at one time, politically unthought of stance to say that we're going to support a public institution that we call a charter. It's really a chartering process. And we're going to use it to do something differently. And now we have many people in the United States 30 years later and alumni who are coming back. Thank you so much for what you do. This is why I wanted to get us together so we can have this conversation. Again, my name is Gerard Robinson, Vice President of Education at the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation here in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
I look forward to having a conversation with you in the future. And all of you, thank you. And uh, let me know how I can be helpful to your individual endeavors. Take care.